of other sub genres. But yes, he's right. This is a more personal one, granted. And the hiddenness argument goes something like this. And I'm just going to, I mean, something like this. I don't have a, a syllogism before me to, to present to you, but it goes something like this. If God really loves people and he wants them to know him and he wants them to follow him, he would make efforts to reveal himself to those people. Right. So if you had a sincere non-believer, a, a, a non-believer who was sincerely looking and searching for God, but not finding God, that would perhaps prove that God doesn't really love them and want them saved. So I think it's a pretty good definition of divine hiddenness. Again, he's very clear here that there is some syllogisms he could use to really state it in its entirety. I love that. I love that he's just up front. This is a quick layman's version, and he's right so far. I don't think he's right so far. I don't like this definition of divine hiddenness. So let me give you a better definition of God as mystery, the problem of mystery. So you're going to get into the problem of everything that you can think of as God is not God. If you can imagine it, that's just an idol in your mind. God is not anthropomorphic. He doesn't have hands or eyes or feet. He's an intellectual being, a being of absolute intellect. And the problem comes with the fact that as a mortal, you are trying to comprehend the incomprehensible. But that does not mean you cannot experience God. For one thing, you can see God in the image of God, that is, in Jesus Christ. That is the union between God and man. That's his son, his word. You can feel God through the Holy Spirit, that is, through his love. But God himself in the Holy Trinity is incomprehensible. He's immaterial. He's not made of matter. He is incorporeal. He is invisible. He is outside of time. And so the problem of divine mystery is that you're trying to comprehend the incomprehensible. So what do you do with that? Do you have faith that what you feel and experience is true? Or do you not? Now, there are going to be other problems, but I think that is a much better definition of the problem of divine hiddenness. It is the human mind striving to comprehend the incomprehensible. That's the problem. That's my definition. Well, I'm not going to take an issue with the fact that he's adding on the sincerity part because it's a big part of the argument. It's also where the argument can break down on both sides because it becomes kind of subjective in nature. Because look, they're sincere and they're trying, but they're not finding. So there must be some fault in God because their motives, intentions, and methods are right. There's a few ways to poke holes in this argument. I think Mike's going to abuse that subjectivity, and that might be one of the differences between atheists and believers in how we respond to this particular kind of claim, to question the sincerity. And I think that's where we're going to have an issue. I think... So, I disagree a little bit here uh, with both people. There is bad faith on both sides of this argument. But as a Christian, we would argue from beauty that you can know God by his creation, that you can know that God's speaking to you all the time. And whether you accept that or not, this video will get into it eventually to something that I want to talk about. But it has to do with faith, with trust. Mike Winger is going to sound disingenuous to this gentleman, but I don't think he's being disingenuous. There are some other good arguments about divine hiddenness. For instance, you could say God chooses to reveal himself at his own time to each individual, but that doesn't pair well with free will. So, so one of the things that got cut out earlier is that I was talking about how Judaism is a revelationary religion, the final revelation being Jesus Christ. Mind you, that's when it gets into Christianity. You must understand that the, the tree, the shoot, the vine is going to be Judaism. And Christians are an offshoot. They're actually the adopted. They're grafted in. And God has the ability to graft in and graft out anyone that he wants. This is going to become an issue right now when he starts talking about free will. Because his conception of free will and what the Bible is saying by free will is a little different. So we'll get there right now. 
for example, let's say that God's going to reveal himself to me when I'm 40 and he's got big plans for me, right? He allowed me to go through this deconversion. He allowed me to go through all of these issues with my family and my friends, etc. He's allowed me to maybe pull other people away from the faith because his plan is greater. When he reconverts me at 40 by finally showing up in my life for the first time, think about the things I'll be able to do for the kingdom of God. This is one of the biggest arguments from believers is this plan of God's timing, but it doesn't work with free will. He's going to take away the free will from the drunk driver that might kill me at 38, or he took away my free will to not eat poorly that causes me to have a heart attack at 39, right? There's all these ways that I could die in a free will system before he he would allow me to see him. That's incredibly problematic. And that's a real source of contention for this argument and one that gets completely skipped over when all you focus on is, hey, I'm starting from the presupposition that my God is perfect and can't do anything wrong. So if you, a mere mortal, say you've been sincerely looking and he hasn't showed up and I know my God would show up because he's perfect and just and loving, then it's on you for not having the sincerity. First, let's talk about free will. So when the Bible talks about free will or being free to choose, it's only talking about the freedom to worship God without fear. And it's also talking about the freedom to choose to worship God or the freedom to reject God. That's it. So you want to call it limited freedom? You can think of it that way. The freedom, the freedom that you're given in Christianity is the freedom to worship God without fear because you have already been forgiven for your sins. And the next piece of freedom is the freedom to either choose to accept or reject this gift of forgiveness. That's it. That's the freedom that's being talked about. It's not talking about determinism. It's not talking about predestination, which is a thing in Christianity. I'm not talking about double predestination. I'm not talking about being condemned to hell or anything like that. But the free will that's being spoken of is the freedom to worship God and the freedom to accept or reject his gift of forgiveness. That's it. I know, maybe this is a little disappointing to you, but it was very eye-opening for me when I had read enough of the early church fathers and had reread these passages enough times that those connections started to form. Now, the next thing that he's talking about, about this lack of sincerity, so there is, I believe it's a psalm that says that God knew you before you were born. A lot of people who are anti-abortion like to use this line. There are some problems here around this when it comes to reincarnation and other, let's say, heresies and uh, heterodox views that can come into play. The orthodox view of this in traditional Christianity or in classic theism is very simple. God created you, and God, because he's outside of time, already knows you before you exist in time. Okay? I know that can get a little uh, metaphysical for some people, but that's what it's speaking about. It's not saying that all people know God. It's that all people have the capacity to know God. And if you don't know, which is another thing that's being spoken of here that Mike Winger doesn't have the language for, unfortunately, is uh, irresistible ignorance. So if you're irresistibly ignorant, if there's something that you're incapable of knowing for IQ reasons, for societal reasons, for uh, mental illness reasons, whatever, uh, education reasons, Whatever reason you can find that's legitimate, you're not held liable for what you cannot know. So that takes that right out the window. So only the people who have the mental capacity and spiritual capacity to know God are held accountable if they reject him because they are able to. If someone does not have the mental capacity or spiritual capacity to reject God, they cannot be held accountable. That would be unjust. So it is just those who can know. And what it is arguing is that they have the ability to know. You can see the beauty in the world and the ugliness and understand that God is there. You can see the suffering in the world and the joy in the world and understand God is there. 
you can read all this material and learn rationally or intellectually or logically that God is there. And if you spend the time to do that and you still reject him, then that's a conscious rejection. And that conscious rejection sends you to hell. But I don't know your heart. I don't know your ability to accept God. And you are not held liable for what you are not able to comprehend. All right, let's continue on. I went a little long. Then it's on you for not having the sincerity. But I don't want to put words in Mike's mouth, so let's just listen here. One is to challenge how much sincerity is really going on in this person.